Okay, everybody, welcome again. Okay, do we do the test now or do we do a lecture? What do you think? We start here. Okay, on the rhythm of the music. <laughs> on the rhythm of the music. So, um, Igor is going to give us uh, actually an introduction to the home network safety and uh, I hope to get some tips there as well. Uh, I tried to find out more secrets about him, but he doesn't want to tell them. <laughs> Maybe have to remind him of what he did last night, but let's not start this. Uh, light the fuse, put it in play, please, Igor. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Oops. Okay, well, that wasn't a great start. I've just broken the job, haven't I? All right. Um, Good evening, or afternoon, whichever. Um, thank you for having me to speak here. Um, thank you for that warm welcome. Um, so is any, anybody wondering why there's a, uh, a picture of some chocolate confectionery on there? Uh, me too. Oh, no, 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 I'm supposed to know why, aren't I? Right. Um, it is an after eight mint. Um, crispy shell, squidgy interior. So why, why, why do we have a, a picture of after eight mint there? Well, if you've been around network security for a while, you probably have a good guess as to the illustration. If not, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a good idea as to why the after eight mint is a good representation of a typical home network security um, in model um, and what the problems with that are. So what are we going to talk about on this talk? Um, excuse me, I just need to click one thing. Probably it has to do with your home network. There we go. Right. Um, so what? What are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about the fundamentals of home network security. It's going to be very high level. It's not going to be in depth. If you've never done anything networking before, that's not going to be a problem. Um, obviously, in, in 40 odd minutes, we can't go into great detail. What I'm hoping is by the end of this session, you'll have a good grounding in which to go away and do some more thinking, some more research, and to think about what aspects of the things that I raise might be applicable for you to do something about. Um, why? Why do I talk on basics of network security at a camp like this? I mean, obviously, a camp like this is going to be loads of experts. Well, there's a few reasons. First off, not everyone's an expert in networking. Uh, there's going to be loads of people at this camp who, for whom networking is a bit of a black art. Um, IT is a large topic. Um, I deal with experts quite frequently who are really, really, really good coders, very low-level GPU-based coding. As soon as they start talking about networking, they're completely in the dark. They know almost nothing about it. And you look at some of the code that gets produced, and it's abysmal. So networking is, a, is, you know, is something that you know, even an expert in another area of IT can learn. Uh, Another reason is I'd like to encourage other experts on network security to be talking to their friends, colleagues, etc., uh, about these things. And hopefully some of the things I raise here might prompt them to sort of think about doing that. It's also a topic I find a lot of people don't know very much about. Um, talking to people generally, you kind of get the impression that network security isn't really something they understand. Um, so how are we going to do this? I'm going to use the vulnerability management theory as a basic framework to structure this talk around. So let's have a quick look at that. There are four basic bits within vulnerability management theory. The assets, the things that we have, the things that we own, the things that we want to protect. They could be digital, you know, your, your email, your files, your PDFs, whatever. They could be physical, your phone, your tablet. The threats, the threats are the things that we want to protect against. Um, Self-explanatory, really. Vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are where either people or systems create a weakness that the threat could exploit. And then risk is the exposure of our assets if a threat is successfully manages to exploit a vulnerability. So let's kind of turn now to take those four items and apply them to network security. So what is an asset in a network? The physical infrastructure, the, you know, the plumbing, the, our internet circuit coming to our house, the physical cables if we've got wired ethernet, the switches, the routers, that kind of thing. The connected endpoints. Um, 
So that could be your, your laptop, your phone, any other device that you have in your home that's connected to your network. And the data on the endpoints, in some ways this is probably the most important item. The data on your endpoints is probably your most valuable asset within your network. You know, if, at the end of the day, if somebody steals your PC, you can replace it fairly easily. If somebody steals your files and you haven't got another copy of them and they're gone, that might be much, much harder to recreate. So threats, what threats do we see? Various types of threats. Denial of service attack. Um, the internet circuit to my house comes in over an overhead cable. If somebody takes a pair of tin snips to that cable and cuts the cable, I've got no internet. Now, for me as a home user, that would be inconvenient. I'd have to phone the ISP if I get them out to fix it, but it wouldn't be terrible. If you're a business of some kind, actually that could have a serious consequence. Ransomware. I'm sure everyone's seen multiple news stories over the last couple of years about a number of high-profile ransomware attacks. Um, and obviously, for those who are affected, they can be quite devastating. Phishing. Phishing is still one of the most common and one of the most effective ways of breaching someone's network security, whether it be home or business. It's much easier to mani manipulate people than it is to manipulate object, uh, computer code, etc. Data theft. Again, you know, nobody wants to have their data files stolen. Um, Tracking. Um, a lot of corporations, governments, websites, etc., uh, will, will do various bits of tracking. And you know, from a privacy point of view, we might want to be con concerned about that and think about that. Identity theft. Identity theft is a real problem for those who happen to be, become a victim of it. It can take weeks, months, years to try and sort out the resulting mess. Botnets. Uh, obviously, if your device gets compromised, it might get used by a malicious entity in order to perpetrate whatever they're doing. Um, that can cause you problems in that it can come back to you in terms of somebody logging that the malicious traffic was coming from one of your devices. Sources of threats. Um, threat actors, individuals with malicious intent. The individuals with malicious intent very, very greatly. So their, their capacity to do damage and their intent can be quite different. Nation state sponsor groups are very, very common. Um, several, well, most, most world powers, big world powers, have sponsored hackers who will attempt to infiltrate systems. Commercial organizations, we give so much of our data away to commercial organizations without really thinking about it. Um, and maybe we need to start thinking about how much of that we should do uh, and how much is reasonable. So sources of vulnerabilities. Design problems. So this is where somebody has designed an application or a system and there's just a fundamental problem with that design. Implementation flaws. This is where the design is fine but actually, when that design has been translated into the appropriate code or the appropriate hardware, there's been a, a problem at that stage and there's resulting weaknesses. Configuration issues. This is a very, very common. Uh, this is one of, probably one of the most common problems that I see in terms of systems being insecure when they shouldn't be. Uh, it's because somebody's either misunderstood how to configure the item or configuration has changed over time. So someone's done something, and then someone else has done something else, and then someone else has done something else, and the system is no longer secure because the original intent has been lost. Failure to apply security updates. There are dozens and dozens of attacks every year which are successful purely because people haven't applied security updates. These are known vulnerabilities that have been around for years and years, and yet systems are still vulnerable. An assumption of trust. We, t we, we like to trust people. We like to, tr you know, so someone says, hey, can I plug this into the network? We want to say yes. We want to be helpful. So, but do, you know, is, is that necessarily always the right thing to do? Um, do we trust the, the people? Do we trust the devices? Do we trust data? Phishing attacks are very, very common and still successful because people will trust attachments they receive by email. They'll open them 
and the payload gets executed. We trust people. A common problem in commercial organizations is people phoning a help desk and saying, hey, I'm so-and-so from HR, you know, I'm, I'm an assistant to so-and-so, I've got this urgent deadline, I've lost my password, can you help me? And a junior analyst, if there isn't appropriate procedure in place, will say yes and try and be helpful, and then you have a compromise. So let's look at sort of vulnerabilities in a typical small network, as in what you'd have at home or a small business. This little blue box is basically representative of the typical edge device, which tends to be an all-in-one firewall router, Wi-Fi access point, etc. We'll have some form of modem in there, DSL, VDSL, whatever, that's going to connect us to the internet. That's going to give us our wide area network side, our external gateway. We'll have some form of routing and firewall functionality. Um, this will basically enable us to send data from the inside to the outside and back again with some degree of control. We've got an internal side, uh, which is going to typically going to be Wi-Fi um, and some form of Ethernet ports. Usually, these devices will have some form of web server for configuration, and many of them have some form of file and print service. Uh, so you could plug a USB key in the back of it, have some files on there, or plug a printer into it. Client devices. We have all sorts of client devices we connected years ago. It tended just to be desktop PCs. Then as things moved on, people started doing laptops. M yeah, more recently, tablets and phones. More recently still, we've started to see more and more Internet of Things. So security devices might be your home security system, might be your IP cameras. Environmental controls have become very popular to attach to home networks. Lighting, uh, particularly in the last couple of years, has kind of exploded. Appliances, so that, you know, your internet connected fridge, freezer, washing machine, whatever. Um, typically, these devices have closed source firmware. You can't see what's going on, on the, under the hood on these devices. They're usually built to a cost, which means that the manufacturer is trying to make them as cheap as possible because essentially they want to give them away with a service. Um, that gives us a couple of problems. One is that they have a lack of incentive to maintain it because they want to keep the cost down. And also, they tend to have a lack of features because they're built to the cost. Adding more features has more cost. Another potential issue is they're remotely, often remotely updatable by the ISP, um, which means that you could look at the device and say, yes, this device is fine, it's OK. But actually, tomorrow, it could have had a firmware update and no longer be secure. The web server is a potential weakness, point of weakness. A lot of these devices, historically, and even st some still today, the web in configuration interface is ac accessible on the outside. If that, were, that obviously gives a nice leverage point to start trying to attack the device. The file and print server. Again, often the, the code on these devices is written once, dumped out, hundreds of units shipped, and doesn't get updated. So if a vulnerability is discovered in either the web server or the file and print server functionality, which is probably the most common location to find an exploitable fault, then that probably isn't good to get fixed. The final issue is, is the fact that on the inside we have a flat network. Um, what do I mean by flat network? This is the after eight mints that we were talking about earlier. Essentially, we have a sort of a crunchy, crispy exterior, which is our router component in the middle here in yellow, which is protecting us from everything on the outside. But everything on the inside is one big squishy mess. Um, so if a device on the inside of our network becomes compromised, then everything within that network is then compromised or can be attacked by the things that, are, that have been compromised. So let's look in detail a little bit more about how networks work in order to understand how we can then address some of those problems. I put this uh, TCP IP model uh, on the right-hand side. Um, this is more of a reference for you to look at later. Um, and I'm not going to go into great details about the, how, how the model works now because it won't be time. Essentially, our, our network is some form of communications media. It could be a wire, it could be Ethernet, uh, uh, Wi-Fi, but essentially, there's a communications underlying communications media. Each of our clients will attach to that media in some way using an interface. Um, the so at that layer, at the network access layer, what we're basically looking for, well, what we basically have is uh, local transmission of data 
in an addressed frame. So basically, when we want to send something from one machine to another, we build a frame, we drop that frame onto the network, and the interface deals with how we convert the signaling from something digital uh, on the client device to a, to a physical electronic signal propagating uh, across the wire. Um, at this level, uh, yeah, so the, the the predominant protocol for, for this level would be Ethernet, if you want to do more research on that later. Our next layer up would be the internet layer, and this is where we have logical addressing. Uh, one of the limitations of the interface layer is that we can only deliver uh, our frames to another client's machine if we already know the address of that client machine, or we have some way of locally finding it out. It doesn't scale, so if you want to build a network on the size of the internet, you can't do that with um, purely uh, locally addressable frames. So the internet layer ad addresses that problem by giving us logical addressing. Um, the units of transmission across that would, would be a packet. So essentially we take a chunk of data and we say we're going to break this chunk of data into individual packets and we're going to put them on the wire. There's no guarantees at this stage that those packets will or won't be delivered. So they may arrive, they may not, and the order that they arrive in may or may not be the order they were sent in. Um, one of the advantages of this layer, however, gives us the ability to route. So we can build scalable networks. We can have a small network here and a small network here, and we can route between the two of them. That, that enables us to build a network at scale like the internet. Typical protocols you'll see here for future reference, internet protocol, uh, ICMP, or, uh, and ARP. The next layer is the transport layer. At this, la this layer deals with end-to-end communication. So at this point, we can then say we're going to have a reliable delivery mechanism from client A to client B. Um, we're also going to add another concept, which is the concept of ports. The idea of ports is that we can say we can have multiple applications running on client A talking to multiple applications on client B, and effectively they can all have their own stream within the network. Um, so. Your, your typical protocols here are for reliable delivery would be uh, TCP, Transmission Control Protocol. And then there's also a best effort uh, protocol that's common called UDP, uh, User Datagram Protocol. And that's basically just lob it on the wire and see if it gets there because we don't really care. Um, our final layer is the application layer. Uh, so this is typically HTTP, FTP, SSH. Um, so this is where the applications that we're using are interacting with the stack below. Um, so, what vulnerabilities do we have here? Well, access beyond least privilege is the, is the first issue. Um, so, if we have a Wi-Fi enabled light bulb and a desktop PC on a single flat network, in theory, the Wi-Fi enabled uh, light bulb could attempt to establish an SSH connection to the PC. Is there a legitimate reason for a Wi-Fi enabled light bulb in your house to be trying to SSH into your workstation? Probably not. Another potential issue is, is guest equipment. If somebody comes around to visit, um, they say, hey, can I jump on your Wi-Fi? You say, sure, give them the key. You don't actually know what networks their PC has been on before. Um, you don't know whether they're running anti any, any antivirus software, et cetera. Their machine could have been compromised somewhere else, and then you're dropping it on your network. It's then got access to all the devices on your network because it's a single flat network. Um, the other thing is that typically your guest devices are probably going to be on Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi has a whole other can of worms in terms of vulnerabilities. So let's look at a few of those. Do you control the hardware? If you go to a coffee shop, jump on their Wi-Fi, you've no idea what hardware they've got, who's running it, what it's doing. Do you control the software? You might own the hardware uh, uh, you know, if you've got your router from your ISP at home, but you don't control the software or the firmware on that device. Are the protocols broken? So Wi-Fi, there are a couple of older protocols, uh, WP, Wide Equivalent Privacy, and WPA, uh, the original version. Um, those have both been broken. They're, they're broken, they're cracked. You can compromise sessions using those. Who have you given access to, as we've already said, you know, and are their systems secure? Whose network have you connected to? If you've been out and about somewhere, you've plugged into somebody else's network, What's been going on on that network? Do you know? Has your machine been compromised? Are you then bringing your machine back to your network to potentially compromise more things on your network? 
Wi-Fi obviously gives you a non-physical attack vector. Um, you can sit in a car outside an office and, and see their network. So risks, we said that basically the risk was the exposure of our assets if a threat exploits a vulnerability. So what do we do? What do we do about the risks? What are our options? Two choices. First one is ignore or accept it. That kind of sounds like crazy, but actually it's not. Um, and the difference between ignoring it and accepting it is basically risk analysis. If we just choose to ignore a risk, okay, that might be a bit dicey. If we deliberately choose to accept it, that's okay. We might look at the probability of something happening. So we, so we do some analysis. We say, okay, what's the probability of this happening? So my internet service coming into my house via the overhead line. What's the probability of somebody chopping that line? Not very high. What's, what's the impact if somebody chops it? Well, my, my internet service is off for a while, but I could always do a hotspot on my phone. Um, and what's the cost to me? Well, probably nothing because the ISP will come and fix the cable for free. So am I going to spend time or money trying to prevent that possibility? Probably not. I'm going to choose to accept that risk. The other option is to mitigate. Mitigation can take many forms, and we're going to look at a few of those now. So some groundwork for mitigation. There's no magic bullet. I get questions quite frequently saying, what software should I buy to make me perfectly secure on the internet? Or some variation of that. There is none. <laughs> a better question to ask would be, what is an acceptable level of risk? For me personally and for you, know, for you as individuals, what you need to do is to say, okay, what risks are there to my data, my privacy on my network? And what, if anything, do I want to do about those? Don't try and do everything at once. There are loads of things you can do to improve network security. Um, if you try and do them all at once, you will go mad, and you'll probably break your home network in such a way that you can't figure out how to fix it. Change one thing at a time, learn one thing. Make it an incremental process. Presume you'll be compromised. So sit down and just think about it here. What happens if? What happens if? And then think through those things. Think through what the consequences would be. That will give you some kind of idea then of how you might want to prioritize um, so that you don't try and do everything at once. You can say, actually, I'm going to do this first, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this. Apply security in layers. Um, I see. Yeah, I've come across quite a lot of people who will sort of say, I've got antivirus on my PC, so I'm done. Is that enough? Well, probably not. Um, you, know, have, you can have the best antivirus on your PC going, but if your edge router firewall device is set up in a way that allows any traffic inbound, you, your machine is still going to get compromised, whether you've got antivirus or not. Security is an iterative process. You, you're never going to do it all in one go, and everything is constantly in flux. So it's one of those things where you can't just do it and forget it. Every now and again, you've got to go back to it and say, what's changed? You know, what new devices I, am I adding to my network? What's changed in terms of uh, security awareness? What protocols have been broken that weren't previously broken? The best thing you can do for network security is not software. It's a personal skepticism and good critical thinking. Um, asking the question, is this a good idea? Should I do this? Why? What might the impact of this be? Will get you a lot further than trying to buy the latest gizmo that says I can do all these things and make your network perfectly secure. So risk mitigation, knowledge. Know your gear. So if you're putting things on your network, have some understanding of what those things are, what they're doing, and how they're working. Dare I say it, think about reading the manuals. Um, think about understanding what protocols they're using and why. What, think about what they should be connecting to and why. Port scanning. Again, if you're completely new to networking, port scanning is probably you know, some kind of black art. In reality, it's actually quite simple to install a program like Nmap, point it at your home network and say, go, and you'll see what comes back. 
Um, even if you do nothing with that other than make a note of it and then do it again in three months' time and see if anything's changed, that would be a great start. Because actually that will give you some kind of baseline to know what is normal on your network. And when you see changes, you can, you can ask the question, why? What's caused that change? Is it something I've done? Is it something I've added? Is it something I've removed? Um, logging. Um, if your firewall stores logs, every now and again, have a, have a browse through them, see what's in there, see if things look normal or abnormal. Again, if you do it more than once over a period of time, you, quite, you kind of get a picture for what normal looks like, and therefore, when you see abnormal, you can, re you can respond to it. Monitoring detection systems, at this stage, you're kind of getting into slightly more advanced stuff. Um, if you get this far, you're probably getting beyond way beyond the average user. Um, but there are various systems you can put in place to give you more data about what's happening on the network. Packet capture and analysis will be sort of the, the top of this tree where you're actually pulling packets off the, out of the network and having a look at what's inside them and analyzing them. So this kind of whole stack here kind of ascends in complexity. So you know, start at the top end with knowing your gear and work your way down to, to wherever you're comfortable. And, you know, see where you go. Risk mitigation, traffic separation. Traffic, traffic segregation is um, a kind of a key area for securing a, ho a network of any kind. It's applying the principle of least privilege. It's saying that Wi-Fi enabled light bulb should not connect to my PC and make SSH connections to it. And I'm going to do something to actually prevent that. There's a couple of ways we can do that. We can do it with the physical separation. Physical separation is basically saying we're going to have two sets of wires and effectively two completely separate physical networks. It's a bit like the plumbing in your house, where you have one set of pipes for hot water, one set of pipes for cold water. The other option, which we can do with uh, a digital network, which we can't do with the plumbing, um, would be to have a virtual segregation. So essentially, when we build our packets that we put on the network, we could put a little tag inside them to say, this packet of data belongs to this network. And we can therefore segregate traffic, traffic and keep it apart. It's unlikely that an ISP supplied all in one edge device is going to support this kind of uh, segregation of traffic. So at this point, you probably need to be starting to think about whether or not it would be a good idea to invest in a better edge device that can give you more capabilities. And there's loads of them out there. I'm not going to try and list them all now because we're here till Christmas. Uh, how can we mitigate risks of Wi-Fi? First off, SSID hiding doesn't really work, just don't bother. Um, there are ways of discovering that a network is there even if you tell it not to broadcast the fact that it exists. WEP is broken, as is the original version of uh, WPA. If your device will let, the, let you turn them off, turn them off. If it won't let, them, let you turn them off, buy a better device. Don't use SSIDs that make you a target. If you have an SSID that says unhackable, someone's going to take a pop at it. Consider shutting down SSDs when, SSIDs when you're not in use. If you have multiple SSIDs for different things, and some of them you only need at certain times, if your device supports it, have it automatically shut off the ones that aren't in use when they don't need to be there. WPA3 is a, a thing now. Uh, might be worth looking at. Yeah. Consider where you put your access point in, in, in the house. Um, I see a lot where people just dump them on the windowsill because right, that's the nearest thing to the phone socket. Obviously, that's then giving maximum propagation into the street outside. If you relocate it toward the center of the house, that will, relo that will reduce the power that's being radiated outside of the property, which reduces the uh, uh, attack vector. Your Wi-Fi is only ever going to be as secure as the weakest device you connect. So think about what you're connecting to your Wi-Fi. And if you have devices that you think might not be particularly secure, think about setting up a separate SSID and ideally virtual LAN um, for those devices. So that, that traffic is segregated. And if one of those devices is compromised, you, the attacker can't get to all of the other devices on your network. 
segregate traffic, kind of same point really. Um, disable access to configuration interfaces from Wi-Fi. So if you, ha yeah, your Wi-Fi access points and your, uh, your home router, your firewall, whatever, uh, these devices typically have web configuration interfaces. You don't really want to um, be enabling access to those from a Wi-Fi connection. Ideally, you want to do those so that you can only get to them from a, from a hardwired connection. Uh, that way, if somebody compromises your Wi-Fi in some way, um, they're not going to be able to take over your network by attacking the, your, your, your router or your access points. Disable Wi-Fi protected setup. Wi-Fi protected setup was one of those technologies that's designed to make people's lives easier. It has vulnerabilities, uh, and essentially, you can brute force your way into any network using WPS. Um, you know, just turn it off and then just connect your, make your Wi-Fi connections manually without using WPS. Subscribe to alerts for the vulnerabilities and patches and apply them. Most of the manufacturers for good quality networking equipment, even at the sort of budget end, um, will have alert systems where you can sign up and they will send you alerts if they have some form of vulnerability that they've discovered on their device and they have a patch available for it, or a mitigation or some kind of workaround. Um, apply the patches. As, as I said previously, one of the most common attack vectors is people attacking systems where a vulnerability has existed for a long time, but people haven't patched. Um, configure logging alerts. If your devices support it, um, turn on the logging, and then look at it every now and again. Use strong passwords to consider multi-factor authentication. So again, this is getting more into sort of, sort of small business ter territory. If you have uh, network devices that you're responsible for, and you can, the authentication uh, mechanism for configuring those devices wants to have a good password, and if you can have MFA on it, even better. Um, consider WPA2 Enterprise over WPA2 Personal. So WPA has uh, two modes. Personal is what you pretty much everyone uses at home, where you have a pre-shared key. You tell it you want to connect to the SSID, it asks you for the key, you type the key in, and, and away you go. Uh, the enterprise version of that, essentially, you back off the authentication to some form of authentication server, and you have a list of users that can connect. Um, if you're looking at any kind of small business type network, that's, some, that's something you should look at and research, uh, ideally on a, any kind of on any, on any, any business network, I would say you want to use enterprise rather than personal. And I do know people that use enterprise on their home networks. Uh, 82.1x is a way of authenticating a device to a network. If you get really serious about network security, definitely worth something worth looking at. If, you're, if you end up in any way looking for after any kind of business network, again, definitely look at 82.1x. Your Wi-Fi is only secure as the firewall. So you can have, you know, you can have the world's best Wi-Fi access point, but if your firewall rules are poor, then your network isn't going to be secure. Think about disabling UPnP. Again, one of those technologies is designed to enable things and make it easy for people, but actually there are a lot of weaknesses in that, and you're probably better off just turning it off and then making the configurations on your firewall yourself. That way you understand what's been done and why. Um, don't enable auto-connect on other people's networks. Maybe. Yeah, it depends how much you trust them. Um, but if, you, if you're in any way unsure about the network, but you really want to use it, Turn off the auto connects so that if you're there again at some future point, you're not automatically connecting to it. General risk mitigation for networks. Um, data retention. Don't keep your data around for longer than you need to. If you've got old data that's defunct, get rid of it, because that way if you do get compromised in some way, that data isn't being harvested. DNS. Um, talk before this one. Um, go look it up if you weren't here. Um, catch the stream. Um, there are ways in which DNS can leak uh, your D so DNS can leak information about what you're doing. Um, VPN consider consider using a VPN. Um, so if you have any reasons not to trust your local ISP, using a VPN to make a connection to a trusted third party of some kind to push your browsing and your other traffic through uh, can give you quite a good degree of security and privacy. Uh, antivirus, yeah, run antivirus, generally a good idea. 
Remove unneeded devices and services. So look at your devices, look at your the things you're connecting to your network and say, am I using all the features on this device? If you're not using a feature and you can turn the feature off, turn it off. Because that way, if there is a compromise of some kind in that particular feature, you're already automatically protected because the feature is not enabled. Is your hardware physically secure? If you're putting IP cameras on the outside of your house, um, can somebody wander up to one of those, pull it off the wall, and in some way gain access? So think about where, you know, where your hardware is, whether it's secure or not. Um, be vigilant with the devices you take to third-party networks. Um, think about the what if before you create or store any data or uh, use services provided by third parties, whether it be, you know, have, have you read the T's and C's for your, for your Gmail account? You know, what's Google going to be doing with your data? Think about whether or not you need JavaScript on your web browser. Um, be afraid of links in emails uh, or attachments to emails. Very, very common form of phishing, very, very common way of compromising networks, both home users and within businesses. Use good passwords and use a different password for every different service that you have. You can get a password manager, you can think of one really good password for the password manager, and then you can have really complicated, snarly passwords for every single service. Uh, that way, if one of those services is compromised, the only thing that the attacker now has is, is your password to that service, not to every service that you use. Um, be careful what you install. Not all free software is free. Um, if you're running devices inside your network uh, that want to send mail or that want to do name lookups, consider having a proxy device where, which you trust inside your network that you, those devices talk to, rather than going, them going directly out to something out on the internet. Slightly more advanced, probably more business-oriented, that one. Containerization. Containerization is one of the best ways of securing web browsing and email. Most people don't do it, uh, even within businesses. Uh, but it's definitely something worth thinking about if you, th uh, if you consider compromise through web browsing or through um, email at risk. So essentially what that says is, let's run our web browser in some kind of container where if there's some kind of compromise, the container gets trashed, but everything else is OK. I know people who run Raspberry Pis just for web browsing, and they only do their web browsing on the web Raspberry Pi. That's kind of you know, the high end of containerization in some ways. There are other ways of doing it uh, within operating systems. You can have virtual machines where you just run those applications. If you visit interesting places, China, etc., uh, assume that your device will be intercepted and tinkered with in some way. Uh, consider taking a burner device rather than your main device. Encrypt your data. Uh, you know, kit gets stolen, lost, left somewhere. If your data is encrypted, you're probably OK. If it's not, someone's got it. Uh, patching is pointless if your configuration management is poor. So if you set your firewall rules up on your firewall to allow any traffic to anywhere, even if all your patches are applied and, your, and the code is good, you're still vulnerable. Take backups. This is the number one thing in many ways. I deal with so many people who say, I've got this problem with this disk. I can't get the data off it anymore. And the first thing I say is, have you got a backup? And they say, no. So. Network security starts with knowledge. Uh, the more you know, the easier it is to sort of understand what the implications of what you're doing are with your network. Knowledge is the basis of risk management. Once you know what your devices are and what they're supposed to be doing, you can manage the risks associated with them and make informed decisions about whether to have that device on your network and how to configure it. Aim for incremental gains. Don't try and do everything at once. Slowly build up your confidence, your ability, your knowledge, and the security of your network. Um, so thank you very much for listening to this talk. If you want to send me any feedback, please do. I'd love to hear it. Um, a big thank you to all the angels who uh, have assisted with this talk and supported it. Uh, happy hacking. I hope you have a great uh, conference.
Great, Igor. Thank you uh, for helping me uh, sorting things out back home. Um, um, are there questions in, in this room, ladies and gentlemen? Someone with a question. You didn't dare to ask that one. Yes, <laughs> yeah. the no, they don't dare. They, uh -huh. they don't dare. <laughs> no one dares here. Okay, then we go party. What do you cool. think? Sounds you good. Have a drink. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you once again, Igor. Hope to see you soon. Have fun, everybody. <laughs>